Hello, everybody. Welcome to TLD Chat. Today is Wednesday, and normally that would mean, let's see, we go you teams, no, you projects and teams. That means today should have been team day, and we can still talk about teams if you guys want to, because we had a great team conversation last week. But you know what we have today is we have the magic of millennials, the conversation of the century. Uh, will it be a true smackdown on the millennial generation? Will we show some love? Nobody knows just yet until we jump in and get this conversation going. We also have one more millennial joining us, the wonderful and fabulous Kara North will be jumping in in a second with us as well. And uh, But before we get there, just a couple quick uh, announcements about what we do and who we are. Do you do training or learning and development of some sort? then this is the community for you. TLD Chat is here every morning, 8 a.m. Pacific Time, 11 a.m. Eastern Time, and 4 p.m. UK Time. We like to talk shop, talk about training, learning, and development. Some days we have guests, and other days we just do an open forum and just talk about whatever the community feels like is on their mind for that day. Sometimes it gets a little uh, less than focused, but we try to keep it dialed in as best we can. Join us every day for TLD Chat, Monday through Friday. And of course, TLDC also stands for the Training, Learning, and Development Conference. It's coming January 29th and 30th in beautiful, lovely Phoenix, Arizona, my hometown. We are looking forward to that, and you can get registered today at tldc18.com. And before we get to TLD chat, let me tell you a little bit about becoming a member. We could really use your support and help, and the more members we have in the community, the stronger the network becomes. There is a lot of value in just hanging out and being a part of TLD chat. But once you commit and become a member, that opens up a whole new door of opportunities for you. So I would suggest hitting up tldc.us and becoming a member today. 15 bucks a month comes out to less than a buck an episode. And you can do 150 bucks for the whole year. And that'll also get you a discount for the conference. So I would encourage you to think about it. Head over to tldc.us and become a member today. This month, our sponsor for TLD Chat is Designing Digitally. Hit them up at designingdigitally.com, D-E-S-I-G-N-I-N-G-D-I-G-I-T-A-L-L-Y. Designingdigitally.com is the fantastic production shop of Andrew Hughes, and they create some fantastic <coughs> award <coughs> e-learning games, gamification, gamified learning elements, simulations, pretty much any of the high-end solutions that you might need, Designing Digitally can handle it for you. Definitely check them out. If you don't know how to get a hold of them after me spelling out the URL, then just hit me up and I'm happy to get you connected with them. We love the work they do and we love that they support TLD Chat. Thank you so much. And we would hope that everybody from the chat would go out and support all of our sponsors, especially this month, Designing Digitally. Thanks, guys. Well, there you have it. Nothing like some pre-recorded promos. And what I want to do is crowdsource these suckers. So uh, I need you guys in the community to uh, step up and record something. Maybe like, you know, 10 seconds, 15 seconds, whatever. Tell us what you like about TLD chat or or make up your own little promo for uh, TLDC 18 and <laughs> yes, someone do a rap. Absolutely. You know, I mean, it, it doesn't have to just be Sam doing the jingles for us. I know there's a boatload of talented people out there. And maybe if you're even brave enough, you can uh, share uh, your, uh, your talents with everybody out there. But hey, listen, that's enough of me chatting and rambling on about this kind of stuff. It's time for me to close this video and get Kara back in here and start today's conversation with the most 
misunderstood generation of all time, the millennials. Ladies and gentlemen, we have three today. We're going to go around the horn, and uh, each one of them will introduce themselves, and then uh, everybody can get ready. But while they're introducing themselves, let me ask everybody in the chat to go check out the Ask a Question section in this platform and vote up your favorite questions, uh, the ones that you want to discuss the most or hear our distinguished panel of millennials discuss and uh, give their feedback on. So uh, I know the video is probably all displayed differently for each person. So, but I'll just go around the horn here as they're displaying for me, and we'll start with Mel. I can hear you now. Yep. Oh, now you're muted. Okay. Now we can Got do it. <laughs> Got it. Awesome. Hi. Hello. <laughs> <laughs> Tell us a little bit about who you are and what you do and uh, how you got here. Yeah, absolutely. So I am clearly a millennial um, <laughs> and that's why I'm here. But um, I work at Amazon as a senior learning experience designer, also um, technical curriculum developer. So I'm on a team called Engineering Excellence and I'm creating um, educational content for software development engineers. Outstanding. Thank you, Mel. And in the, uh, the our second square, Kara North. Everybody knows Kara North. Kara, why don't you just give everybody a quick reminder of who you are? Hello, I'm Kara North, and I, too, am a millennial. I work at The Ohio State University. I'm an instructional development specialist here. Um, the part of the University that I work at is called SEAT, and that stands for the Center on Education and Training for Employment. We're a workforce development and research center for the College of Education. I primarily work on assessment professional development for technical teachers in the state of Ohio, but I also like to do a little bit of everything. Nice, very cool. And Eric, sir, how are you? Our, our token oh, right. millennial. <laughs> I have uh, had to represent all the male millennials for this. Um, but yeah, um, I'm a millennial. I, I work as an e-learning specialist right now. Um, I am also um, a teacher, but I'm kind of working in this field right now trying to explore that. I'm really new to it. I started actually next month will be a year as an e-learning specialist. Um, so yeah, it's just having a lot of fun hanging out with you guys and learning all I can. Cool. And you know what? Thanks for hanging out with us. We appreciate that. You know, getting uh, everybody involved with the community is always fun. And it's good to hear that you're uh, you're getting some value out of it and, uh, and and learning as we go. So have I have I uh, have I paused long enough to give everybody a chance to vote up Has everybody in the chat jumped into the Q&A and voted up the questions? Wow. looks like this is the most active ask a question section that I've seen in a long time. All right. Thank you, everybody, for doing that. All right. So here we go. Let's just jump right in. The number one voted up question of the morning is the moniker millennial a badge of courage or slander to you as a millennial? Who wants to take that first stab at that? Are you proud of being a millennial? <laughs> Mel? I, guess, I guess I don't have to raise my hand, but yeah. Like, that's something that I always do. Um, As a millennial, maybe you do. I don't know. This is what we're trying to find out. I mean, I would prefer not to be lumped into any group of anything, to be honest with you, um, <laughs> other than like a nice person. But, um, <laughs> but yeah, I don't like a lot of the stigmas that go around it. And um, a few years back, I was, I'm, I'm now in my 30s, but I was in the 30 under 30 group in El for Elliot Macy's learning conference that he does every year. And at the time, it was when the whole millennial thing was like super negative and everyone was talking about it because it was like 2014, I think. Um, so we got a lot of, a lot of um, hate. I'm not, we didn't get, we got more hate than love, I feel like, at that conference um, with the millennial thing. It was what everyone was talking about, and they were talking about it from such, like, a negative standpoint, and I think, I think that there's often these such negative stigmas around it that I would prefer not to lump myself into the category, but obviously I'm here because it is my truth. 
<laughs> <laughs> you can't change your age, right? You know. Yeah, I can't. I can't do anything about it. I'm a millennial. Yeah. <laughs> Eric, what about you? I mean, I guess I haven't really seen a lot of benefits from being called millennial. Um, I think it's, a lot of it's like we're really tech savvy. Like that's the you know you take these generalizations and they get applied onto us. It's like we're tech savvy. We know how to do this. It's like yeah, grandma, I can do all of the things you asked me to do without a problem, but still I don't like being the one, like, you know, uh, those ideals kind of pushed on me is that, okay, you can do this. It's, um, you know, for instance, um, kind of funny we're talking about this, but I just joined the um, local ATD uh, board. I'm uh, I'm the VP of social media and I got invited to do that uh, because the director, um, where I work is plays part of it too. He said, well, you can bring the millennial perspective. I'm like, well, that's a lot of responsibility now because now I have to be the one in charge of the social media and uh, understand the millennials and how we think and apply that to get more recruits. So, um, Do you think that'll be a job title someday, director of the millennial perspective? <laughs> you know, maybe. I'd, I'd take that job. Why not? <laughs> Kara, what about you? What do you think? really proud of the moniker either just what Melissa and Eric said I I'm just a person and I don't really like being lumped into kind of this group where people think that we're lazy and entitled and they've seen kind of poor examples of people but I'm sorry every generation has poor examples of people <laughs> I, I don't know why there's all the hate toward us and I think it's interesting Melissa shared about the 2014 Elliot Macy they were hating on Millennials and I think it's just gotten worse if you go and just Google Millennials and I shared the picture with Luis um, we'll have to bring it up if he's in here but somebody took um, a bunch of different headlines from newspapers about Millennials are killing this Millennials are killing Killing that millennials are killing everything and it's like no we're not killing everything like things just kind of need to to change and to Eric's point about this kind of millennial perspective I'm kind of in the same boat with Toastmasters I joined Toastmasters and they're like oh my god you're a millennial you need to help us change the world and bring people in it's like <laughs> No, like I'm not just the only person that can recruit. Everybody can recruit and bring people in if they see value in the organization. So um, exactly what they said. I, I completely agree. So don't hate on millennials. We're just people. <laughs> That's a fantastic way to wrap up that question. So um, and I think in my experience, that's pretty much everything that you guys mentioned i've heard from others as well i don't i don't think i you know everybody's like you know why can't we all just get along sort of uh, answer <laughs> all right let's drop down to the next question uh number five i'm a millennial this is from faith faith thanks for joining us uh in the chat today as well by the way Oh, now a different one just popped up. All right, I'm going to start with this one down here anyway since I started it. I am a millennial, and it baffles me when people ask us to create courses specifically for millennials. We usually use minimalist designs and no in-your-face instructions as millennials are tech savvy, yet get told to add them. Tips for getting ideas through to non-millennials that review these courses first? Any tips, anyone? I honestly, I think we have to approach it and push back a little and, and um, look at it from and the per perspective and push for the perspective of we're creating things for people, not for a specific group. And like Faith was talking about using minimalism and things like that. It's about good user experience design, not good millennial design. Um, so it's about just helping people to get to what they need when they need it in their moment of need. And you know, putting a lot of clutter and things, you know, that might have been the way that people have done it in the past. It, it, it's the world that's changing. It's not millennials. It's the user experience field that's like blossoming right now. All of the studies that are coming out of it. It's about users and not about millennials. <laughs> Couldn't agree more with that. And I think 
something a lot of younger people in the field struggle with is kind of being that order taker versus asserting your, asserting your authority of knowing exactly what you're doing. And again, that's kind of an ebb and flow. And just like with dealing with SMEs, a lot of times you have to deal with the people that are approving these courses. And I know that I have dealt with it a lot in my career. And one thing that I've started to do, my last project that I worked on, is I've really started using learning personas for building things and getting everybody on board on this is who this is for. So the last piece of instructional design that I just finished up, um, our learning persona, her name was Doris, and she was a family consumer science teacher that's in her 40s in the state of Ohio. And we really kind of to tailor the um, instruction to what she would need for making better classroom assessment for her people so again it, it is a fine line it's very very hard especially when you are new and not a senior to an organization getting that buy-in but I find that if you have a backbone and you're not afraid to push back eventually someone will listen to you exactly yes yeah. Uh, yeah, I agree yeah. so much sorry go yeah. ahead Eric. no let's no. go there I was going to say, um, it, you really got to understand your target audience for any project. So um, in order to build the proper experience, so if you can guarantee that 100% of your target audience is millennials and they're, you know, that's the group, then you can cater to that. And then you could go out and do some like user testing and kind of figure out, okay, they like this, they don't like this, and then you can build a better program for them. But um, they kind of just blank and say, well, we should design something because, you know, when, you know, 30% of the company's millennials, how we engage them? It's like, well, then oh, you're really, but if the training is going to be for, you know, 100% of the company, well, that's now the minority, you know, that 30% millennial group. So, you know, it really, you know, if you understand the audience, you know, regardless of what age group they're in, um, you know, you gotta be able to kind of cater to that. So, you know, my tip is just really understand the audience. Um, and then when you bring that to, you know, the people who review the stuff, um, if they're challenging it and um, they're not, they're saying, well, this isn't this or whatever. You'd be like, well, based off, you know, the user testing or based off this feedback that we got through surveys or, um, you know, typing and kind of sharing it with them, this is the kind of direction we can take. And, you know, regardless if it's a millennial or not. So. Yeah, I think, I think you guys, you guys ruined interfaces by taking away beveled edges. Don't we all loved the beveled <laughs> edges buttons, right? And now we have flat buttons and that's just, just come on. Why did you guys do that? <laughs> it's all your fault no it's one of those things where the, i think the thing that that um that, that kind of gets annoying for me is when people say um you know we really have to stop doing courses and we need to make them shorter because these millennials don't like to sit and take the hour-long courses and i'm like I didn't like sitting and taking no. hour long courses. I don't think <laughs> anybody did. And now all of a sudden it's like, well, now we should change because the millennials don't like doing it as if older people enjoyed sitting for an hour, listening to an exceptionally boring self-paced e-learning course, you know, <laughs> I mean, <laughs> yeah, nope. I, I mean, I think it's one of those things that, at the same time, I think, yeah, there's there were millennials around when the concept came out. And so maybe maybe they just latched on to like, oh, millennials are here and we have this new people are going to do shorter courses. So it must be the millennials. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, I think it's the I think it's the tech that, that came along with the millennial generation more than anything. If you look at the trends in in tech and the timing and everything that we do, right, everything that all of the trends in learning and development follow the tech curve and and we follow slightly behind the tech curve i must say but you know and then whatever generation happens to be prominent at that particular time gets sort of bundled in with the changes that were thrust upon them but you know we're we're now finally talking about short e-learning and short and smaller content because you guys are the first generation to have grown up, you know, with Twitter, with, with, you know, social media that basically supports the idea of just collaborating, being connected with other people in very short, either if it's via an image or via text or via a short video or being able to live stream on a mobile device, all that kind of stuff. So uh, it, that's my thought on the whole thing 
But I think a lot of people think millennials are still super young. Mel said that she's in her 30s. I'm also in my 30s. And I remember dial-up internet. And I remember getting on ICQ and AIM. And I think a lot of people think we're kind of in this little pigeonhole, but we're not. I mean, it's a really broad base of people. I think, what, the early 1980s to the 1999 or something like that. So it's a really broad base of of people, and I don't think that all of it necessarily fits into kind of the different uh, stereotypes that are out there. And again, that's a big pet peeve of mine. Oh, you don't know what it was like before internet. It's like I grew up in rural eastern Kentucky. I was home this past weekend, and the internet was terrible. I, I don't know how my parents put up with it, and it's still bad. So, you know, I I think that there's a lot to be said again about these whole stereotypes. Yeah, well, it's a it's such a broad range, right? I mean, I I forget what what is the age group currently I, for how I, they define millennials. I have a I have a huge complaint on top of that, but I my boyfriend recently looked it up because it's I think 1983 is the starting point, but I don't know how long it was. But my biggest complaint to what Kara was talking about is at work, and since I've been in the workforce. This is the this is the one thing that I absolutely cannot stand that leaders and managers and other people say to me. Oh, and this is exactly what Kara said. It'll be like, oh, like you didn't grow up with that, or oh, you didn't know about that, or oh, you can't like this band, or oh, you can't do this. And I'm like, I'm like, I, like what? Like I'm not allowed to like Queen because I because Queen was before I was born, like, and was still going on. But like I'm. I mean, like, I was like, that's very bizarre, but it's, it happens in meetings. It happens. It's happened um, since I've been in the workforce and I'm like, I'm just like not allowed to like things or know about things. Like, um, someone asked me if I was, if I even ever had a phone with a cord on it. <laughs> I was like, what? Yes. I have. <laughs> yes. Yeah. That was my first phone. <laughs> so you guys, so um yeah i'm i'm all of a sudden trying to watch my words and be very gentle about asking how old you are because gen x and boomers seem to have some sort of issue with that maybe you millennials don't but if we're looking at like 82 to 2008 as being sort of the range i mean not 82 but well yeah did i say born in 82 to 2008 is that kind of the the 20 years that they're bulking in millennials I'm not uh, sure. I'm I thought sure. it cut off at maybe. Oh, here we go. Mid mid 1990s. Let's see. Okay. According to the Wikipedia, there are no precise <laughs> dates for when this cohort starts or ends. Demographers and researchers typically use the early 1980s as starting birth years and the mid 1990s to early 2000s as ending birth years. Hmm. So there you have it. So you guys were probably <laughs> what born around 97, 98? <laughs> 80s. <laughs> yeah. In the mid 80s, middle late 80s. The end of the 80s. I was I was graduating high school in the mid 80s. <laughs> so was my I'm mom. Definitely not. I'm definitely <laughs> not a millennial. <laughs> All right, let's move on to the next question. Uh, this is great, by the way. Um, I had to go on my rant. <laughs> beautiful. I love it, Mel. Love it. But it's true. I mean, it's a great, um, it's a great point. I hear it all the time. And I must say, I, uh, I find myself, um, you know, stereotyping a bit as well and making those comments and, and feeling a little shocked, but I shouldn't because my kids, uh, know the lyrics to some classic rock tunes better than I do. So, and they're like whatever comes after millennials. Um, Z, Gen Z. Yeah, I think my oldest daughter might fall into the millennial category. I think she does uh, have a tendency to um, associate with that with the millennial generation. But um, I, I think my other two probably fall into. Uh, well, I don't know. They're right. They're going to be right on the right on the borderline. Just like I landed right on the borderline of boomers and Gen Xers. So um, it's not. I don't really relate to any of them. We're the. Uh, I'm the lost generation. I guess I don't know. 
All right, here we go. Another question. Please describe what would make you feel loyal to a company? What could an organization do to keep you around for more than a year? Wow, that's a that's an excellent question because I hear this one a lot and you read it in articles and you hear people making the quotes of did you know that, you know, some odd percent, I don't know, I'll just 35% of your organization are planning on leaving in the next year and they're millennials. What are you doing about it? Sort of thing. I don't know if that percentage is right, but um, you know, I hear I hear that all of the time. You know, so what you know, let's get real. Let's start talking to some of these CLOs out there, some of these corporate heads of companies that are stressing about this kind of stuff. What yeah. can they do to keep you around? Um, so for, for me, I think it might be different depending on different people's needs. And I don't even think this is a millennial thing, but for me, especially I put, so I love my career more than anything in the world. Like it's most people know it's my passion. I blog about it. I'm doing stuff outside of work about it. I, I live it, breathe it, everything. Um, and for me, it's really working with leadership to identify my career path. And if I don't see a career path at this company, I don't want to be at the company. And that's and that's the biggest thing for me. Um, and and I'm super proactive about that type of thing. Um, and so when I'm having conversations with managers and leadership and things like that, I need to know that they're going to help me to get to that next level if I put in the time and the work and the effort and prove myself. Yeah, I couldn't agree more with that. I'm the exact same way. Um, I've stayed at two different companies for almost five years, one being Amazon and then one being here at Ohio State. And one thing about that is that Amazon and at Ohio State, I've had over five different job titles. I like having variety. I like being able to go to different paths, but I do think that that's something that is kind of difficult about learning and development in general is what is the career path in learning and development? You're maybe a junior instructional designer, and then you're an instructional designer, and then maybe a senior instructional designer. But then I think that that's a big leap from that to CLO, and not every organization has something like that. And I, I think that that's also kind of difficult to path out to. And I'm interested in a bunch of different stuff. Um, I've done a little bit of everything, and I will continue to do so because I'm kind of all over the place. I'm kind of like Tigger. I bounce around. But uh, I do like organizations that have variety and have different things that can get me involved. But just like Mel said, I, I want to be heard, too. Um, you know, I've been very blessed to have a lot of great managers in my career that have really kind of taken me under their wing and helped me explore different options and really care about my professional development development so that's been huge too eric what about you man we lost your video by the way and i'm not too sure if you you turned it off on purpose or if uh if it's a technical no, bandwidth. i think it's i think it's just a bandwidth the wi-fi here is terrible okay. millennial issues right um <laughs> so yeah i think the uh for me you know uh, i think someone posted like the, the paycheck isn't really a huge priority i mean i think you know paycheck obviously is it's important, but I think it's about the auxiliary perks. So we grew up in the generation of hearing about how amazing Google and Facebook were. And it's like, those are the companies like we want to like work for. That's like, that's what we grew up is that it's like, oh, come hang out here or, or, um, or look at these, these fun things people are doing while working, these creative, like half day creative sessions and that kind of thing. So a lot of companies now you're seeing are trying to emulate that in some way and kind of have those auxiliary perks, you know, um, you know, they have gyms in the buildings and, and things like that are, you know, you know, shakes or smoothies, and you know, once a week or something like that. So, um, you know, for me, that that's important is, is, okay, what else can you provide? You know, I mean, I'm really big into like my own professional development, you know, that's why I'm here um, in the TLE chat here. Um, and, and then go through those things and, and spending time for my own professional development. I think, I, I wouldn't say millennials, but if you want to generalize, um, that's really important to millennials is giving, them time during the workday to for their own professional development um, and it would help kind of spark creativity you know they could turn that in and help the company through those means too um, you know especially with this field like Kara said like there's not for promotions that kind of thing it's pretty it's linear and it's very small and so you know we're gonna we're gonna do some work and then it's like okay well what's this next adventure that I can go on I'm gonna work for another company start my own business uh, 
maybe change fields altogether. So I think a lot of it has to do with that. But you know, it comes down to what else can companies provide more than just a paycheck. You know what? You know some companies allow dogs, or, or you know that's kind of cool. Um, you know, again, that's probably the most important thing is the auxiliary perks. I mean, I for me specifically, and Amazon has like a ton of perks, but I'm not sold on the perks. Um, if it's going to be a perk, I want it to be like, you can go to a conference once a year and we're going to pay for it. Like something like that. Um, I'm, I'm not like really, I'm, I love like that we have like a banana stand here and we get free bananas every day and things like that. But I, it's like, if we didn't have that, like I wouldn't be upset. <laughs> I mean, I agree with yeah. you now. That's why I've stayed at OSU because I get free tuition. And I'm going to continue to use that as much as I can. And it baffles me that there's, like, I think, less than 1% of all employees even use that here. And that just blows my mind. Like, why on earth would you not do that? Yeah, and I, I think that at the end of the day, I think that is right there that defines the, the cluster of the employee base as a whole and not just millennials, right? There are those of us who have found our passion, who have found the career, the job that we love to do, and therefore we hang out in places like this with other people who love what they do, and we engage in it in our off hours even, or we do you know, similar things that are related to it, or you know, it's all about what, what can the company offer us that is, helps us learn more and helps us get better at our career and helps us improve our skills. But there is that other, you know, and, and it's just a reality. There are those people who work just to work and they, they work just to get home for the weekend. They work, you know, they, they, their, their work isn't their passion, isn't their life. It's just, it is just the check and it gets them to the weekend so they can go, you know, do whatever they do on the weekends and then do it again. And it, I think it's just a reality of the workforce and that changes, that does kind of change the dynamic for leadership and for people running companies trying to figure out, okay, what do we do, you know, to keep these happy? Because maybe there are some people at Amazon that are totally pumped about the bananas, you know? I mean. Yeah, and I think I think the one thing that leadership should do, and I've seen, I've seen them do it at several companies, is – and if you're a manager, this is something you should do. Find out what drives your employees. Find out what they're passionate about. Get them a stretch assignment on an another team on something that is more related to their passion. Build them. And, and a part of being a good manager, and leadership should recognize this, is managers that help their employees to get to their next step and get to, to leverage their strengths. And I beyond the, the bananas and the free everything, um, like, it's about helping people to thrive in the workplace because that's what, what's going to help a, a company thrive. Yep. Hey, let's do a quick lightning round on the, uh, on the questions here to try to catch up because we've got a boatload of them here. So um, we'll, uh, we'll, we'll, we'll kind of try our best to hit these real quick. So, so take a look at them uh, and as we go through them a little bit or as somebody else is answering and try to like pre-come up with a quick short answer. And if we want to dive deeper, maybe we can circle back around to it. So I'll just start at the top and jump through. So what does your baby boomer boss need to do to be cool? Not wear cargo shorts. I don't know. I don't know why, but I just hear that all the time. For some reason, people are totally against the cargo shorts. But I don't. I don't want to hijack the conversation. So, um, I honestly, I don't know that there that there's anything that they need to to be cool. I think they just need to be available, and they need to, you know, have that conversation with you, like. Like, what do you need to, um, what, what do you need from me is, is the, the, um, best way in your one-on-ones, which you, sh which I hopefully managers are having once, a, once a week or bi-weekly or, or something like that. Um, what do you need from me so that you can, can be successful? 
Agreed. And my boss is actually a boomer. So that's kind of funny that that the question is in there. But one thing that I really appreciate about him is he's gotten to know me as a person. So it's not just care of the worker bee, it's care of the person. And he's really taken an interest in things that are interesting to me. He's actually a psychometrician. He's not even a learning development guy. But when he's out at a bookstore or something like that, he'll bring me different books on learning development. He shared with me training manuals from like the 40s and 50s that he's had that I've been able to dig through and kind of sell these artifacts. So just knowing that he cares about me as a person and has his own way of supporting my career, I really appreciate that. Nice. Eric? Yeah, I'm going to say that uh, be able to listen. Austin has been able to listen um, and just kind of be like, uh, you know, listen to my ideas and then try to encourage that, you know, Oh, go for it. Let's see what happens. And kind of like just enable me to you know, be successful or to fail and then let's reflect on it. So, you know, being able to kind of have that personal conversation is really important. Yeah. And, and, and don't think of it as managing you, right? Like don't manage me, get to know me and be helpful to me. That help me to be good at what I do. Help me to grow and to, and to, to allow me to share all of my gifts with the company and be that person that helps that flourish. Don't manage me. Help be help. Be helpful. I guess is what I'm trying to say. So, oh, that was that wasn't a very fast lightning round. So maybe we'll try to do this one quicker. Do you visit a library on a regular basis? If so, to use which services, Mel? You were you were busting a gut earlier trying to figure out how to answer this one. Oh yeah. So uh, we were in the green room talking about this. So I'll keep it short. But um, so my boyfriend goes to the library almost every single week, and he reads about a book a week. I know it's like absolutely crazy. So we often go to the library together. I'm probably in the library more than most people. Um, and he, whenever we go to a new city, he wants to go to the library there. So we're big library fans. Um, that's my answer. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. So I use the library more for public spaces. A lot of meetings that I go to outside of work and different um, organizations I'm a part of meet at the library. So I like the fact that it's centrally located and there's a lot of free meeting space, but I am guilty as charged. I am a Kindle person. So I uh, get books on my Kindle, but I do get them through my library. I use the overdrive and download them on my Kindle, which is great. Yeah, Eric, what about you? Uh, usually right now for libraries, we go for my daughter. Uh, we take in there, let her get books. Um, and that she can play with all the other kids and stuff like that. So they do a lot of community service stuff. Yeah. So that's we take advantage of those types of events. Yeah, I think I think the question is probably, and Joe, maybe if Joe's here, maybe he can help clarify a little bit. But I think the question is kind of geared more around, you know, do you read digital books or do you look at, you know, do you like the touch and the feel of a of of a real book? But you know, just the part I wanted to add, I hadn't been to a library in years dare I probably say decade or so. Um, and I recently went back uh, because a colleague in town here was doing some work and she was like, oh my God, have you been to the library, Brent? And I said, no, I haven't been there. And she's like, they've got, it, it's like a community center more than anything else now. Yes, they have books, but they teach you how to get hooked up on the digital, their, their digital library that they offer. And now they also have a studio, uh, an audio video studio, a, a maker space, uh, you know, office spaces, um, little rooms you can book for, uh, you know, hanging out and chatting with other people. Uh, you know, just it's, it's really, I mean, it's an amazing resource. They've really, really stepped it up and changed with the times. And so I would encourage everybody to go uh, check out your local library and, and just see what they've done because um, there are a lot of really valuable, cool things you can do there. Uh, Joe also asks, if you could create your own social network that's different from those available today, what features would it include? I'll take a stab at this. I think that this is something that's going to be 
in the near future. But one thing that I love about the learning and development community is I've got to meet so many people face to face after I've followed them online and been a fan of them for, for a while. I think it would be great if there was not necessarily like a check in option, but it would show you if you're at a conference and you're online that it would show you kind of who's there and who's around. And that way you could say, oh, wow, you are at this conference, even if somebody's not necessarily posting about it. And then that way you can kind of find peers at events that you're at. I think that would be really cool. I think that exists, but I'll let somebody in the chat uh, put a link in and, and find that. No, well, Snapchat has a feature like that. You can get your, uh, you can see who's nearby or something like that. So, Oh my gosh, that's right. They just turned on that feature a few months ago. I remember that. Yeah. Everybody freaked out about it. Parents, tell your kids to turn that feature off because you don't want all the perverts in the neighborhood to know where they live. <laughs> <laughs> what else? Come on, Mel. You're, you, you, there's got to be something you'd like to see in a social network. Um, I think, well, so I'm going to go on the business side again, but for a social network for internally for a business, I'd like to see something where people can easily create events internally and see who all signs up for it. And um, they can be categorized really well because I do a lot of like the learning and design events. And I, I'd love to be able to like book a room or book a space like through it too that's consecutive um, and be able to share that with people and easily find it. So that's something I'd like and for the business social media aspect of things. Nice. Eric, did you think of anything at all? No, I've thought about it. Um, I think you'd probably have to go around, you know, I think with curation being really big right now, um, I know there's a lot of different tools out there right now, but I think if someone maybe tweaks it to find it, you know, be more applicable across, you know, almost a non, uh, non-academic, you know, if you can do curation for the, you know, fun kind of thing that it's catered towards even younger generations. I think if you're going to have a popular app, it has to be really relevant for them. So, you know, uh, something where kids can curate their own content and have some fun with that, you know, use it with the schools or something like that. That's probably where I'd go with that app. That would be cool. All right. Very, very excellent, excellent points. Luis drops in Instagram or Snapchat. We'll just go around the horn. Which, which one do you lean towards? Instagram. Instagram. Snapchat. Oh, I forgot to push the start recording button. Dang it. Okay. So we had Instagram, Instagram, and Snapchat, which is interesting, uh, you know, as far as what, uh, why. Maybe we'll circle back around to that on another show. Maybe we'll do Video Friday and we'll talk about <laughs> why Instagram versus Snapchat. That might be an interesting conversation, but let's hold off on that for now. And because, uh, man, I, man, the more questions we drill through, the more people ask more questions. So, I don't know if we'll ever catch up with all of them, but we'll work hard at it because that's what millennials do. We're hardworking people, not <laughs> lazy at all. What do you do if you don't have a search engine available for you to refer to? How do you find answers to your questions? <laughs> my um, my great grandpa told me about this book called the Encyclopedia, and so I think we I think I'd have to use that somehow. I think there's like a glossary or something that we can. We can use. I don't know. I've never seen one in person, so I wouldn't know. <laughs> yeah, the Smithsonian, I think, has a set. <laughs> my parents still have encyclopedias at their house, and my dad pulls them out sometimes like, hey, look at this map and look how much things change. But if I had an issue, I'd like to think that I would try to think through it first, whatever it is. And if I didn't have a search engine, I would totally go to social media and push it out to my personal learning network and seeing what kind of information I could get on it. Yeah, and and for me, I, I think it's working with other people, which which is actually what I do most of the time, um, especially with the XAPI stuff. Working just working with my colleagues through problems, whiteboarding things, and um, it's just about the people connection. Like I I love working with people. I would rather work with people than be googling stuff all day. <laughs> yeah, I like. <laughs> I like Dana's answer in the chat. Sorry, I just had to pull this out. She says, go home and hang it up for the day till Google comes back. <laughs> <laughs> Any excuse to do that, right, Dana? <laughs> I'm, I'm so down with that, and I'm not even a millennial. Uh, given the choices available today, when you want to learn something new, where you go? Oh, similar question. 
probably the same answers i'm assuming yes your personal learning network talking to your peers working closely with folks anything anything different when you're learning as opposed to just searching for content well for me it depends on what i'm trying to learn if i need to like fix something i think youtube is probably the best um, just because it's quick couple of minute videos um i use lynda.com uh, coursera that kind of thing if i want to learn more of the uh, more complex things as they go on. Um, but, you know, it's again, I just use those different outlets to master what I need. More reach out to someone like a mentor. Hey, can you walk me through this process? Um, what does that look like? That kind of thing. For, uh, for me, what I like to do is I like to um, identify someone who is really good at that one thing and ask them how they learned it or ask them how they're currently still building their skills in it. So um, I do that a lot with like, web development and then graphic design. Um, so I really wanted to get into After Effects and I knew someone who was amazing at After Effects and she had learned it over the past year and I was like, hey, like, how did you learn this? And she actually had a, a playlist on YouTube that she created and she gave it to me and that helped me a lot to be able to learn After Effects. Add to that, I kind of do the same thing, but especially when cool interaction and like an authoring tool. And I'm like, wow, how did you do that? A lot of people are pretty generous with sharing a template and I basically just break it and try to rebuild it. And I've learned a lot from that. Excellent, excellent. Hey, uh, there's a ton of questions in here, but uh, Yarun, good to see you again, my friend. You, being in the chat room, he's got a great question. Do we still have no Googling in the bar type rules? And I think that I, I think that's a, that's I think that's one I think that's one way of saying do you have to you still have to put your phone down I mean I don't know I'm I'll paraphrase for him but I know I know that my kids and, and apparently there's tons of rules that came up around social media like if I posted more than one photo to Instagram, I got shamed by my kids because you can't do that. You can't do that. You're only, you should only do one a day. And so they would spend like the whole day trying to figure out what was the best shot of the day that was going to be like their, their one Instagram hit. And, you know, then it's, you know, when you're out to dinner, don't bring your phone out and, you know, the rules, all of the rules around social media. It seems like since, again, you guys grew up with it, like, you know, are the rules legit, uh, you know, or, you know, what's up with that? Yeah, maybe I mean, just me. maybe I just have I, weird kids. I don't know. <laughs> No, I. Uh, I've heard, I've heard, I've heard that rule though. Yeah, there's, there's, there's the kind of unwritten rules, the social cues that you pick up, like just handling social media. When I was, when I was teaching, the kids, um, I taught eighth graders, so I mean, I think they're maybe at the just at the end of millennials. I don't know, really know. It depends on how you define the age range, but they, um, but they would have rules like that with Snapchat, like, you know, the proper way to do that. If you get one, how to send it back, that kind of thing, and they need to have like legit rules, and if you broke them like you'd be outcasted you know so you don't want to you don't want to break the social norms when it comes to social media uh, but i think i think for me personally um one of the things that i didn't really notice like i was listening to um i think simon sinek has a really good thing about millennials on youtube and he kind of talks and addresses this this i don't know if you want to call it a problem or a question um but he talks about how like you know we'll be sitting in a meeting and you have your phone out and how that could be a sign of disrespect because, you know, it's kind of like, well, I'm gonna put my phone on the table here. And, um, you know, it just kind of says the signal. And for me, I never, it never like occurred to me. It had been like, if I was talking to my manager, I was talking to people that had their phone out, I, just, I didn't, wasn't, I was never offended. Maybe it's just because I grew up with just phones and just, they just became like a constant part, extension of our hand now, you know? So I don't, you know, where some people, maybe of older generations, might be offended that, you know, you're not stopping whatever you're doing to do that. But, you know, I think it's, um, I think, I, don't, I would say millennials have, you know, they've kind of redefined the social norms, but I think that's every generation that, that's happened, like the, what's, what's acceptable and what's not, and those, that changes over time. I think it offends me if I'm talking to you and you have it like in front of your face. Um, but I think anyone would feel that way. But by just having it out, it doesn't bother me. Yeah, it's just it's about being considerate. Like when I'm having when I'm on like my, a date with my boyfriend, like 
don't I shouldn't have my phone out. Like I should be having a conversation with him. It's just being considerate. <laughs> Yeah, I don't. I mean, I think maybe older generations, it was looking at the watch, right? I mean, have you ever been, had a conversation with somebody and they just keep looking at their watch? And I, I think that's as bad as somebody continuing to look at their phone, right? It's like, what, what, what are you, are you, do you are you needing to get out of this conversation? Why do you keep looking at what freaking time is, right? You know, I mean, <laughs> I'm, I'm guilty of turning my phone on to see the time, like just like. Just like in a meeting, like, oh, when's my next meeting? When you know? this, oh, checking your calendar halfway through the first meeting. Yeah, it's uh, it can be brutal. All right, I'm going to jump around now because these last few questions uh, are uh, are of, of equal importance. And I think we've covered a few of these in uh, in one way or another. But we have to cover the conversation about laziness. Is it true that millennials are not interested in doing work? <laughs> I would have to say no. that this is not an accurate representation of what we've read about millennials because the three of you are very interested in working hard and doing what you're passionate in. Yeah, yeah, I would say it's it's completely false, but it's also dependent on the person. It's about the person and and to what you said, Brian, are they passionate about their work? Like you're, if you're passionate about your work, you're going to want to be involved in things and want to do a really great job. And so for me, like, for instance, like a normal day for me is waking up at like 6 a.m. Um, I go online and I go on my LinkedIn in the morning for probably like an hour or two, um, like probably an hour, respond to everyone who's res who's um, commented on anything, blog posts, whatnot, um, just be like, taking the time to do it. I go to work. I walk two miles to work every single day. Um, walk two miles back home. I work all day, and then I go home and I write a blog post. And sometimes stay up until like twelve writing my writing just like one blog post. Um, and so I, I spend quite a lot of my time involved in work. Me too. Think, yeah. Go ahead, Eric. I was just say um, I, the lazy stigma. Is, and I guess you got to speak in general terms, but, um, you know, I think millennials, our generation, we were allowed to go to college and kind of pursue whatever we wanted. I think our parents and grandparents kind of encouraged that, you know, they're the ones that really worked hard, you know, post World War II and, and that kind of provide a future for us. And so it's like, okay, go whatever you want. So, you know, if you get a, a degree in like, you know, 15th century literature and you can't find a job and, you know, you're working, you know, forever part time and, it can kind of create that negative stigma of like, well, you're just lazy. It's like, well, I'm passionate about what I've, I've studied and spent time in. I can't do anything relative to that field. And so, um, you know, it kind of, it can create the lazy person, but that's, I think with any generation is going to have that issue. Um, but it, again, it's, if you can follow your passion, which, you know, I think, yeah, I, I, I thought about this type of question. I think that if there was ever going to be another re Renaissance, I think the millennials would do that. Because the millennials is the generation that's probably the most educated out of any past. It's just we have some people that have gone to college and at least have secured a, a bachelor's and then, you know, continuing ed from there. But, you know, a lot of these people are, are creative and a lot of these people are passionate about things, but the, the job force isn't, isn't there. And it's just, you know, you can't, you can't pursue careers and, you know, how many people have philosophy degrees and they just they couldn't do anything with it? you know, or a history degree, you know, unless you get a break or you tie it into some kind of business needs or something like that. Um, but, I, you know, it really, de it depends on, you know, each individual, what they're passionate about, you know, I kind of agree with what Mel said and, and being able to stay focused, you know, I, I, I enjoy work, but I also want, you know, to have fun with what I do. And to me, that's, that's probably most important. Yeah, Lisa comments on the question, too, and I think it's a fair statement. She says, I think that that's just a perennial stereotype for anyone in their 20s, not necessarily generational. And I think it would be true. I, um, you know, although I will say that there are, um, I, I have a few friends who have, you know, I've asked these questions to because I'm just wanting to know. And it's like, what do you feel like? What is it like in your workplace, in your environment? And, um, you know, when you talk to, Gen Xers and whatnot, they'll, for the most part, when you talk to them by themselves in a group, the answers may be different, but when you talk to them by themselves, it's, it's, yeah, you know, they, they don't, they, they do have a tendency to meet that stereotype and that, that at least that's the perception. 
and um, in, you know, in certain situations. So I think it definitely depends, but, you know, there must be a reason why these stereotypes get created, right? If there wasn't at least a certain number of people, you know, falling into that bucket and, and that, you know, being defined that way, it, it wouldn't, it, it wouldn't become such a thing. Yeah, and I want to speak to what Lisa just said. Um, she said to me, millennials seem more aware of life balance than other generations. One of the easiest ways to make me mad is to tell me, I don't know how you do everything. And a lot of people tell me that because I do get up about 4.30, 4.45 every morning, get on social media. I get to work about 6 a.m. in the morning, usually quit around 3. So just yesterday, got up at 4.00. Five, did the social media thing, get to work. Three o'clock, uh, three o'clock um, I called somebody that I've been kind of mentoring um, through instructional design. And then I went to present at an ATD thing here in town. And then I had class at 8.30 at night. And so during the week, don't bother me. I have a lot of stuff going on, but the weekends are kind of my balance, my Zen time. I'm a complete sloth on the weekends, but I go hard during the week and it makes me appreciate my weekends even more. Yeah, I, I concur. I'm the same way. I, and I don't, it might seem easy. It might make it seem like it looks easy, but I'm exhausted all the time. <laughs> I'm so tired, but it's not I'm tired right now. <laughs> well, you can function so well being exhausted. You know, that's the skill. Maybe that's a millennial skill that everybody should uh, should learn. It's the positives. Let me and let's just finish it up that way because we've only got a few minutes left. Let's talk about the positive things. Come on, why are millennials awesome, and how can we all be more like you? I think. Um... Millennials, now that they're entering the larger workforce and they're like taking over companies um, left and right, I think it's, it's, I mean, I'm not saying you don't have to conform, you know, I think it's just, you know, I think it's just drop this, you know, the stigmas and the labels and that kind of thing. I mean, at the end of the day, it's just, you know, we're people and we all have our own individuality. And I think that's any generation would, wouldn't want to be, you know, casted for their, for what their peers might be and what people perceive as that, you know, you know, we have like all those old people and it's like, well, no, that's not fair to them. So I think that's, you know, honestly, just listen to what I have to say. Sometimes I say some good things. Sometimes I don't. And if I don't, how can you help me get better at, you know, what, what I'm doing? So, I mean, just, you know, treat us as people, nothing special. And I think for me, I like to kind of say the little pun with my name, I care a lot about something. And it's something I got from my parents. My parents are both very hardworking people and they didn't have the luxury of going to college and I'm very thankful for it. everything that they've done for me. And I really do care about everything that I'm involved in or it wouldn't be worth my time. And I feel like that's the best thing you can give. Any organization is, is your time. And you know, if somebody is showing up and giving their heart and giving their time, I think that you at least deserve to listen to them. And I'm going to leave it off, I guess, with the one thing that I say every time, and it's it's to millennials and, and to non-millennials, to everyone in general, and that's... Um, be open to trying new things. Don't be afraid to fail. Don't be afraid to break things. Um, don't get stuck in a rut. Just explore, um, experiment, and um, that's how new things come about. And that's something that I, I really, really preach. Nice. Nice, nice, nice. All right. So um, what else? I, I think that's probably a good enough place as any to wrap it up for the day. You guys have been... Uh, fantastic at sharing the millennial mindset, as it were, uh, with everybody uh, here in TLD chat and TLDC. I hope everybody has enjoyed this conversation as much as I have. Good, good times and great conversations. Let's do a little bit of promo. Go round the horn, and you guys tell people where they can get a hold of you and find you and follow you on all the socials and all that kind of good millennial type stuff. Eric, you want to start? First? I guess I'll start. Oh, sorry. <laughs> I'm going to post my Twitter and LinkedIn in the chat. So I'm getting it right now. You can find me there. there. It's probably the best way to, to do. Yeah. So I'll post it there and then people can just follow me or connect. So. Awesome. Awesome. Hey, Eric, thank you so much for hanging out with us today. I appreciate you being, uh, being a part of this and, and, uh, and hanging out with us. Thank you. Thank you.
Mel, okay, jump in there. <laughs> Sorry about that. Yeah. Um, so uh, Melissa, melslearninglab.com is my website, and you can look me up on LinkedIn and on Twitter. I'm Mel Milloway. Awesome. And Kara, what about you? So I'm Kara North. You can find me on Twitter at Kara North 11. And most days I'm here on TLDC. Outstanding. And for those of you who maybe don't know this, but Kara helps us out so much on TLD Chat and is such a big, big, big part of what we do and making sure all of this happens and, and runs at least as smoothly as we try to make it look. <laughs> she... She, she carries a lot of that. We got Craig in the chat, too, who helps us out with notes when he can and uh, is, uh, is absolutely, um, we, we love millennials, right, Luis? That's, uh, we, we couldn't, uh, you know, this, uh, this type of chat wouldn't work without you guys. I'll just, uh, I'll have to leave it at that. It's a new way of doing things, and it's basically been an experiment from the very beginning, and I uh, appreciate everybody um you know hanging out with us and uh, and being a part of what we're doing at tldc so i'm gonna go ahead and close out your videos you guys thank you again so much good to see you all and we will uh we'll see you again in the the next tld chat adios all right and that was the millennial episode and i think it went very well i loved the questions thank you all so much for um, dropping all the questions into the chat uh, or into the ask a question section, uh, loads and loads of fun. And it has been a great day, but we're at that nine o'clock hour. And that means today comes to an end. And it also means that we've got tomorrow to look forward to. So we've had two Joes this week, Joe Cook on Monday and Joe Ganchi yesterday. If you guys want to listen to those recordings, uh, those are up and ready to go. And after the millennials today, uh, fantastic, fantastic time. If you want to check out tldc.us to check out our schedule of all of our fantastic up and coming guests, you can do that right now. I'm kind of glancing through it right now, but uh, hit up the website and take a look and you can always find me uh, on the Twitters at B Schlenker and feel free to hit us up and let us know what you like and what you don't like about what we're doing here at TLD chat. This is for you. This is for you guys to have a community to hang out and to do that professional development that you love. So, um, anytime, anytime you feel like, uh, you want to maybe be a guest, maybe you want to help out, maybe you want to, um, uh, just, um, you know, just be a little bit more deeply engaged and you're not sure how feel free to reach out. That's, that's why we love what we do. So, um, it's, it's absolutely, uh, talking to other like-minded professionals in the industry is my favorite part of uh, of what we do here so anyways everybody have a fantastic day you've all been so wonderful and again a big shout out and thank you to eric mel and kara for for being our uh, our, our millennials on the panel today and to have this fantastic conversation so everybody have a great day and we will see you all tomorrow Bye, everybody. Do, 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 do.